All right, this is a review for physics, electric circuits, high school physics. Uh, it's going to be helpful to look at the reference tables for this as we do this instead of afterwards because electricity unit is massive. All kinds of stuff here. I'll be flipping back and forth to this over and over again. This is indeed review though, so I won't be going too deep into this. It's also going to be very helpful, I think, to create a circuit up top to refer to as I do this. I'm going to create a very basic circuit with one resistor, one battery, and no devices to read any of the information yet. My resistor is very lazy. Let's make sure we got the right symbols here. Let's get to that a section. When you have to draw a circuit, you do need to use the appropriate symbols. So I've got my squiggly resistor, and I've got my battery. Let's talk about current first. Current is the charge flow rate, or really the amount of charge that passes a given point in a given second. So we're going to define current as change in Q over T, or the amount of charge that passes in a given second. Current is measured in amps. One amp is a coulomb per second, which makes sense because it's charge per time. Uh, two conditions must be true for current to flow. You're always going to need a potential difference, which is really the battery, the power supply itself. Something needs to push the charge. And there always needs to be an enclosed path for circuit for the current to flow. If there's a break in the circuit or if there's no end, there's going to be no flow. So you need to have an enclosed loop. One good way to look at that is make sure the positive and negative terminals of your battery are completely connected. The positive terminal of the battery is the long parallel line. The negative terminal is the short parallel line. Also, this bottom one seems simple, but it's often confusing. Anytime we have any sort of junction or fork in the road or alternate path for current to flow, the total current that goes into that junction must be equal to the total current that comes out of that. When I get to parallel circuits, it'll be easier to show that. Let's talk about resistance. Or uh, Actually, let's get back up here to current. Also, conventional current flows from the positive terminal to the negative terminal. So you always kind of draw your arrows leaving the positive and approaching the negative. That's conventional current. Electron current flow is actually the true flow of current. you got to understand it's always the negative charge that's flowing in a real circuit. Arbitrarily, back in the day, it was defined as positive charge flowing, hence we use conventional current, positive to negative. But in reality, electron current is really what's happening, and it's truly negative to positive. So if you get the very rare but occasional question that says, what is the direction of electron current flow, it would be negative to positive. Don't draw that in, though, because we always deal with conventional current when dealing with our circuit setup. Resistance. So resistance is, the, uh, is more or less like the resistance of the flow of charge or the resistance of current itself. Kind of like friction for current, but not really. Uh, you know, resistances themselves are defined or determined based on the material or the object itself. So typically speaking, unless it's a variable resistor, the resistance of a resistor won't change once that item has been created. That said, just because we have high resistance doesn't always mean we're going to have low current. So we're going to get down to Ohm's law in a minute, but recognize resistance is one factor that affects current. The other factor is potential difference or voltage. I'll get to Ohm's law in a second, which will help clarify that. Your unit for resistance is the Ohm, which is that horseshoe symbol. It's a Greek symbol of omega. And, uh, you know, you could technically say that an Ohm is equal to a volt per amp. Again, if you look down at Ohm's law down here, which I'll get to in a second. So Ohm is the best way of writing your units, but it's not the only way. We also have this concept called the resistance of a wire itself. So we have basically what I like to think of as two types of resistors. You've got the resistor itself, which is the item that's placed in the circuit that's designed to actually cause resistance. Or a toaster or a light bulb, really any device can act as a resistor. But then you have the resistance that comes from the material of the wire itself and the shape and size of that wire. I'm going to go ahead and redraw my battery down here, my whole circuit. This wire itself will provide some resistance. That's defined by the symbol rho or by the equation rho L over A, with rho being the resistivity or uh, unique to the material being used. L being the length of that wire, 
and A is the cross-sectional area of the wire. So let's get to L and A first, they're the easiest to understand. The longer the wire, the more resistance that wire will provide to the circuit. Should make sense, because the longer the wire is, the more wire there is for electrons to flow through. So it's going to be impeded by the material of that wire. So if we have a really long wire, then by the end of that wire, um, the current has been exposed to traveling through a lot of material. So it should have met a lot of resistance. The cross-sectional area would be like the width of the tube. Think of it as a water hose. Uh, the fatter that hose, okay, this is the cross-sectional area. So we're looking at a kind of a front view. If I were to try to draw it three-dimensionally, that hose would be a tube, right? So the circle is the cross-sectional area. So the fatter that tube, the more current can flow through it, so the less resistance it has. Small, narrow tube, very little current can flow. There's not a lot of space, so it's got more resistance, since it's an inverse relationship. Rho is the material itself. The material will provide its own resistance, and each material in this world, mostly metals, will provide different levels of resistance. So for that, we got to look at the resistivity table. Aluminum, copper, gold, nichrome, silver, and tungsten. You'll see how they can change over here on the side. A couple things to point out, though, on resistivities. One, once you know the resistivity, you can look up the material. So some problems might say, well, what is the wire made up of? Fine row, solve for the material. Or it might be indirect. It might say a copper wire two meters long, et cetera, et cetera. You need to know to look here to find that row symbol. A row symbol is that is that uh, Greek symbol that looks like a P. Also, this is when this is only true when the temperature is 20 degrees Celsius, which is always going to be assumed unless said otherwise. What you do need to understand is as the temperature of an item goes up, its overall resistance also goes up. And as the temperature goes down, the overall resistance goes down. This is one reason why we want to cool electric circuits so they can have less resistance or more current flowing. That's a concept. You just need to know that. There's no math for that one. Ohm's law is a ideal relationship between voltage, current, and resistance. Now, not every single circuit will actually follow Ohm's law. However, ideally, and more often than not in Regent's level, it does. Ohm's law is written as R equals V over I in your reference tables, but a lot of teachers, including myself, teach V equals IR. Rolls off the tongue better, I'm not sure, but that's how I always was taught it. This is what I always use. This simply says uh, the voltage is equal to the product of current times resistance, or uh, you can rearrange it for R, you can rearrange it for I, so I guess I'll do that too. I is equal to V over R. It does help to look at it in this form so you can understand how current is affected. So if we have large voltage and low resistance, we're going to get high current. If we have large voltage and large resistance, we could end up still having small current. And there's all kinds of combinations you can think of. Because there are no exponents, because it's just one simple um, fraction uh, ratio, if we were to plot the voltage over the current versus the current, we'd find that the slope of this graph, V divided by R, is current. And it is a linear relationship. So as the, I'm um, sorry, not V divided by R, V divided by I the slope of this graph is resistance. What's wrong with me here? V divided by I. This is voltage. This is current. As the current goes up, the voltage must also go up. Or a better way of thinking about it is as we have higher voltage, the current must increase to maintain the same level of resistance. Resistance should not change. It should stay constant because, again, it's devi defined by the device itself. However, every now and again in the region's curriculum, you'll see a little uh, graph that'll do the same thing, voltage via current down here, and we'll see something kind of starting to taper off. It starts to curve a little bit. This basically implies that the resistance is changing, and the reason why that resistance would change, and the only reason that you would have to think about why the resistance would change, is because the temperature of the resistor itself changes. Because remember, as the temperature goes up, it becomes more resistant. All right. I think this is going to be a good breaking point for this video. I'm going to break this into two parts, the kind of the basics of electricity, and then I'm going to talk about circuits themselves, and that can be some a time-consuming application. So I'm going to split this into two. I'm going to end now. Thank you.